Okay. Right now, I'm telling you this, um, and I've chopped this from the beginning of the, uh, from the end of the video to the beginning of the video, because my mic, for whatever reason, this has never happened to me before, keeps shutting off as I'm trying to explain these things. And as I was explaining, I realized that the mic just wasn't talking. Um, so I am going to go back and I'm going to check the video and I'm going to make sure that I'm going to find out where it stopped and I'm going to repeat it. So this is, this is too important to hide. And obviously, you know, the devil doesn't want people to know the name of the antichrist because if, if they did, they knew it was Ocas or Kas, then, uh, they would know that he's coming from Iran and that he's going to be, uh, the Supreme leader in Iran. Um, that's just how it's going to happen, right? Um, so I'm going to make sure whatever, whatever was cut out in my audio, I'm putting it back in. I'm going to re repeat it. You will know this is not something that we can avoid. Jesus is coming. It's more specifically, the Antichrist is coming and we need to be prepared. Um, as I pointed out here, the patience of the saints, the people that know God shall be strong and do exploits. That means miracles. You cannot think that you are going to live uh, as a, an, a, a Republican Christian with your guns and your freedom. And that when the Antichrist comes, all you have to do is shoot him or stop his army or that like somehow we need to we need to set up a militia. God specifically says here in Revelation. The patience of the saints. Where is it? Revelation. Oh, goodness. Where that where did that go? Right here. Right here. He that leads into captivity, those who get caught by the forces of the Antichrist are going into captivity. They shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. You use a weapon to kill, try to get away, you will be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. If you're going into captivity, you're going in for a very specific reason. God wants you there. He wants you there. They will do exploits, miracles. Maybe you'll even save some. If you get caught, by all means run. Try to get away. Hide in the mountains. Go hide with other Christians. Find that community of, of believers because we're going to need each other. But understand that those who get captured will be captured. Our lives are nothing to save. It is already saved. Jesus has saved us. All we need to do is have faith because we know just by seeing the time, just by knowing the name and understanding that that time is here, that there are less than 10 years before Jesus himself is back on earth and we are living with him if you're one of the 10,000 saints that come with him for the millennial kingdom or will be living with him in eternity after that period of time. Either way, if we die, it's nothing but sleep. Literally nothing but sleep. It's nothing different than stubbing your toe. Everyone's got a different amount of pain tolerance. Stephen was stoned to death. He didn't feel it. He saw Jesus and God took away that pain. It specifically points out he didn't feel the pain. God took that pain away. So what looks like pain and suffering to the enemy, God can take that away. So it doesn't matter what the enemy thinks he's doing to us. He cannot harm us. God will protect us. Our physical self may be cast away. That means nothing. It's not going to hurt you any more than, than God will allow. God's not going to allow us to be... <laughs> To, to take anything beyond what we can already accept. So if you're the type who gets a, a stub toe and you're down for a week, like God understands that. You're going to be fine. Jesus will not allow you to handle, to take more than you can handle. You are strong and you will be fine. He will use you to save more and to do miracles. If you have to walk through walls, guess what? You're walking through walls. That's just going to happen in a time where a man who was dead and is suddenly alive again, that will happen. Nothing means anything anymore. Physics, nothing, nothing at all. It's all changed.
because the Holy Spirit will be here with us, the saints, in the time of the Antichrist, which is soon. I want to say now, but we have not seen the Antichrist rise yet on the scene. We know 100% his identity, Ochus, or Cas, from the Persian Empire, the last of the Achaemenid kings, number eight. We know exactly who he is. We know exactly where he lived. We know exactly where he died. We know his age. He was 71 years old. We know he's going to arise as a man slightly younger than this who will literally head over to try and see what's going on with the Mediterranean and the Athenians and find that Israel is still alive where every other nation in the world, every other empire that has ever existed, that this man knew about and conquered, has fallen and is forgotten and no one even knows anything about them anymore. But Israel persisted of all people. The last country that he hated but didn't do anything about because his fathers before him told him to leave them alone. Right? And this is going to be his plan. To infiltrate with flattery. To cause a peace with Israel as he did with the Athenians and the Spartans before destroying them. And he will do the same to Israel. Because they will accept him as their Messiah. You've seen the evidence. I'm going to go through now. And I'm going to scrape through all of that. And make sure that whatever was muted. I'm going to voice over. And you're going to see it again. Um, and in the comments. Well, the comments don't even matter. Um, read the Bible. Read the Bible. I gave you all the evidence. Daniel chapter 9. If you want to look at specifically what the Antichrist does. Once he's here. Once we already know he's here. It's going to be pretty irrelevant at that point. Um, the Bibles are definitely going to be outlawed, right? Christianity is going to be outlawed. We're going to be running for our lives and being murdered, right? So pretty useless at that point. But Daniel 11 specifically calls out the Antichrist. That's what you need to know is his identity. Because the identity, knowing who this man is, you can tell everyone you know exactly who he is. And that, that information... That information itself, this video, for however long it persists, the, the document that I'm going to have, the timestamp of the document shows that this information was revealed long before that man showed up. So when he does show up, the question people are going to have to answer is, how the heck did this guy know the name of the Antichrist or know the name of this leader who we think is for peace, but he literally called him out, he knew his name before he rove on the scene and before he did his things he already called him out as exactly what he's going to be doing it's it's the fact that we have the information of the future beforehand that will point people to god point people to jesus and to the reality that this world is not ours it belongs to god and specifically more specifically that jesus himself is coming back and you don't have a lot of time to make that choice to understand that Jesus died for your sins. And if you do not put your trust in him for life, you are going to be separated from God. Whether or not you believe in God does not matter. You will be separated from God forever. Your anger at, at God is not going to matter. Your perspective, your opinions of God do not matter. He is the supreme being of all of creation and he has drawn the line in the sand you are with him or you are against him he came and he lets you do whatever you want but he died for your sins and if you want to wait until he returns and try to justify your actions and you being a good person he will send you away you have no choice him or it's death that's what he's coming to do he will establish righteousness and if you are not on his side you are going away with every other wicked person who ever existed in all of history and all of you know non-history everything that was ever written or not every evil person will be separated from god for eternity you are not a body you don't just go into oblivion when you die you are an eternal spirit. You will have eternity whether or not you want it. Whether that eternity is spent with something good or something that is unspeakably evil is up to you. 
Now, read the read the scriptures, please. Just just look at it. Look at the history, which I've pointed out to you. In secular history, it's all there. Ties up perfectly to eight specific kings throughout history in a very short scripture, very short passage, literally lines up eight kings and their exploits. It is impossible, that level of coincidence, particularly at a time where most of those kings did not even exist. It calls out the names of these people. Like You cannot deny the legitimacy of the Bible now. It's all right there. We have the timestamps. We know when these things were written. The book of John, the book of Revelation was prophesied. All these things were written 250 plus years after John should have died when Jesus himself said that he would have John persisting, living on earth as he is to this day until Jesus returns and proved it in that John wrote his gospel and the end time revelations 250 years after the gospel of the of his brethren of Matthew, Mark and Luke. He was there. He was there with Jesus. And 250 years later, he wrote those gospels. I don't know how much more information you need, how much more evidence. These scriptures, these old documents exist in Dublin. They're still around. We've dated them. They are in a museum right now. Proof with with times proof of who wrote them and when you cannot deny it anymore we know who the antichrist is and we only know that according to thessalonians second thessalonians because the time is revealed he is revealed at the end that was the promise of god he did it i'm gonna go i'm gonna stop talking now i can just keep circling around that that fact get right with jesus and by get right i mean realize that he's real and he died for your sins and he's coming back very soon. And the only way you're getting to anything good, to heaven, is if you understand that he actually truly loved you enough to die for your sins, knowing that you didn't care about him. You didn't even know him. And when you heard about him, you didn't want to know him. But he still died for you and allowed you to do whatever you wanted in your life selfishly and against him, knowing that you were against him. But gave you the opportunity to repent. Now is that time. And it's your last chance. If you don't do it now. The Antichrist arrives on the scene. It may be too late for you. Because it says that everyone. Not written in the book of life. Will worship him. I, I'm pretty positive. That means. If if he shows up. And you haven't accepted Jesus. As, as your Lord and Savior. Specifically. As your only way to eternal life. Then it's over for you. So. Listen. Listen. Watch and be ready. Ocus Natus. Darius the second. That is the name and identity of the Antichrist. I'm going to go through the information with you now. So, there's two things you need to understand. Daniel 11 gives very specific information about the kings that arise leading up to the Antichrist. The book of Revelation, chapter 17, in a section, uh, verse 10 and 11, I believe, gives the riddle of the, uh, the, the eight kings, the riddle of the seven kings, um, or eight kings. There's, we'll get into it. Um, between those two things, the identity of the Antichrist is revealed. Of course, Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, God promises essentially that he will not reveal the name, the identity of the Antichrist until the last days. So because this is revealed now means that we are currently in the last days leading up to Jesus's return and the start of the millennial kingdom which is a thousand years. Jesus pointed it out and, uh, through Peter, um, who specifically said a day to God is like a thousand years to us. That wasn't, that wasn't metaphor. 
um, or an analogy that was quite specifically so that we could look back at what Jesus said, tear down the temple, I will raise it up in three days. Yes, he meant his body, but God does not exist within time. He exists outside of it. So everything you see that Jesus said was past, present, and future relevant. So Jesus mentions the destruction of the temple, essentially his body being the present, the temple being the past, and the uh, the church being the future. If we look at when Jesus was crucified and resurrected and left, that means that three days would be 3,000 years. You might look at it and say, okay, well, it's 2023. Why would that mean that the last days are now? Because of the millennial kingdom. It's not the final judgment of the world. It's the judgment of Israel that leads to Jesus' reign on earth, because that is promised in scripture, his reign on earth for 1,000 years. And at the end of that 1,000 years, Satan, who is, who is bound at the end of the whole uh, Antichrist saga, he's bound for 1,000 years. And then he is released, and of course he stirs up Gog and Magog, specifically the lands, the people left on earth that are not Christian, um, even after Jesus returns, those people are stirred up and they head to Jerusalem, to Israel, to try and destroy the people because they they don't have any any uh, weapons of war. They aren't prepared and Satan essentially convinces people that they can destroy the nation and take over. Um, and of course, the instant that they gather themselves together and head to Jerusalem, Jesus essentially snaps his fingers and Thanos is everything. Um, and gets rid of they all die immediately but at that instant as well they are also resurrected along with everyone who ever existed and that is the start of the judgment of god the final judgment that leads into eternity so that's a three thousand year period two thousand years have already passed and at the end of that two thousand year period which is approximately the point of jesus's death so like we're thinking we're looking like around somewhere around 33 years in um because the 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 history changed uh at the birth of christ anno domini the year of our lord that's why time changed literally even though now we call it common error but it's literally the time changed because of the revolts that happened and the subsequent eventual destruction of the roman empire because of jesus so zero to 33 Round 33, because that's when Jesus was crucified. That's approximately the, uh, the the point of reference for when Jesus will return. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. Whatever. We don't, because times have changed. But we know approximately when that's going to happen, which more specifically means we know approximately when the Antichrist is going to arrive. And now we know the name, Ocus Natus. Ocus, um, the O part, is essentially an honorific. You can actually see that in some of the other descriptions of other kings and people. They have the O in front of their name, and sometimes they don't. That's because, like Japanese culture, um, you add the O in front, like, in order to uh, provide an honorific. For instance, like a mother, Okasan. You could also say Kasan. The O is an honorific, meaning this guy's name is chaos or chaos and that's why if you look at the number of the beast you know 666 in the greek because that's what's described that's what the uh book of revelation and the gospel of john which were both found in egypt written in greek that's what they specifically are said john is still alive he is one of the the prophets the two witnesses john specifically was called out by jesus as not going to die he says if if i have it that this guy this specific disciple should tarry until i come what is it to you telling this to peter if he lives until i return what is it to you and of all disciples all 12 disciples they were martyred john is the only one who they attempted to martyr and failed and history says he died of natural causes but no one knows 
he just kind of disappeared and we assume he didn't die or we assume he di didn't die of uh, martyrdom because no documented case of his death exists but jesus pointed out he will live and moreover according to the book of revelation which was written by from the perspective of john therefore by john was dated to 300 something bc or not bc ad this gener this millennium 300 ad the gospels of of you know peter or mark luke and john or the the other one uh, mark matthew mark and luke those were dated to like 600 AD, like 30 years after Christ's um, crucifixion and resurrection. 30 years after that, which means that either the Gospel of, Revel of John and the Book of Revelation are fakes, which is how most atheists or agnostics would look at it because of the fact that it was dated, meaning it was written in 300 AD, meaning that... 250 or yeah approximately 250 years later john still alive was already probably in his 40s or whatever um wrote the book of revelation and his gospel his account of jesus 300 years after the fact in egypt in greek that doesn't make sense unless it's unless this is god right so we're looking at these things in greek john gives the number of the name uh, which counts out to 666 if you're looking at greek numerology and phonetically it doesn't make sense it's literally k the first character has the, the, the sound k second one is ks and the last one is s but if you look at this guy's name that I just gave you, Ocus Darius II, um, Darius II was a title. It was not his name. Ocus was his actual name. And it can be pronounced Cass, essentially. And that sounds a lot like chaos. And I don't think that's a, um, I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, but this is literally this man's name. And the fact that he comes from Iran um, is shown in Daniel 11, which we will get into. But the name matches up to what I found in scripture. And scripture matches up to what I found in history from secular accounts. We're going to go into all of it. But so you know, Cass is the name of the Antichrist. He is his identity. is not just the name. This is the actual human being who lived in the Persian Empire, the eighth king of the empire. He dies and he comes out of the pits of hell and will then become the Antichrist. He will broker a peace with Israel as he did in the past during his reign with Athens and Sparta during the Peloponnesian Wars and through his his. Uh, political devices and backing enemies in order to break down his other enemies that's how he ruled he he used people around him and finances in order to extend his kingdom and that's exactly what daniel depicts of the man of sin the vile man who goes into perdition which can also be translated as destruction um, because he does destroy jerusalem in fact in his time Jerusalem was already kind of rebuilt and established because of Cyrus, the first king of Persia, and because of Darius, who uh, was in Daniel's time, uh, allowed the the Israelites to continue building the walls. And Artaxerxes, right after Xerxes, the Spartan killer, the 300 guy, Artaxerxes during the time of Nehemiah, who also allowed the Israelites to not just go back and rebuild the, the gates of the city, but also to send all of the captivity back to Jerusalem to live there outside of the influence of, uh, of the Persian Empire. So those kings allowed that to happen. Artaxerxes being the last one who apparently was a follower of God and was raptured just like Enoch and Ezekiel. And we'll get into that. 
but most specifically his son his um his his bastard yeah his bastard son is darius Ocus. um and that's the guy who is the antichrist so he is very familiar with what happened in jerusalem um and what happened with the essentially the resurrection of the the nation of israel Let's get into it. I'm going to switch over here. We're going to start with Daniel because, again, this is the most information we have about the Antichrist. Um, and I have another document which shows specifically how much of the the Antichrist is, is described um, throughout the Bible, the entire Bible. I've, I've read it like five times. I know what I'm talking about. Um, so I, I, I also created the document for Revelation, specifically looking for all references to anything in Revelation throughout the Bible. And so anything related to the Antichrist, I have it documented as this is the, the um, book and the verses and the chapter wherein references to the Antichrist exist, along with every other topic in Revelation. And I will link that in the description of this video because... People should know this, and I have no problem with giving it out freely because it was given to me. I didn't, I, I didn't go to seminary. Um, I just believe in God, and I believe that if you are a Christian, you need to know what you believe. And that's not a common perspective taken in Christianity, and I get that that's not something that um, is required for salvation. Um, I am a teacher. That's what God put in me, right? But I do know that the people who do not know this stuff are in for a world of pain when the Antichrist comes. So I'm hoping that you will hear this information, study it yourself, you'll have the verses, you'll have the references to history, which you can look for and investigate and see how this is too perfect to line up eight kings and tell specifically what their exploits will be and for it not to be relevant to you. You, you will know by the end of this video exactly exactly who the Antichrist is for sure. I've already given you the name, but you'll see it and you will have no doubts. The only doubt you'll have is if you don't want Jesus to return. Um, so here we are. So we'll start with the very beginning here. Skip the skip. Okay, so um, Darius the Mede. This is important because Daniel is alive during the reign of the king of Persia, Persia, who is known as Darius the Mede. Why is that significant? Again, there are multiple Darius throughout the Persian Empire. Specifically, the eight kings that we're talking about only goes up to technically Darius II, who really wasn't a, a an official king. He was part of the seven, the Achaemenid kings, the, the Medes, because that's where they came from. That's where Cyrus came from. Cyrus was a Mede. And through his line... You had the Achaemenid kings, and they ruled the early kingdom of Persia. Once you get into Aukas, the or Kas, the um, Darius the second, the bastard son, things really, really fall apart with the Persian Empire, um, and it's Game of Thrones from there to the end. So the only ones that really matter, according to Scripture. Are the Achaemenid kings because they are the ones who essentially establish the rule of the Israelites some of them not all of them um, but those three kings part of the Achaemenid Empire and then the last one is the worst of all of them so we start with Darius the Mede who is the fourth king in the series so during this time during the time of Darius Daniel's given a prophecy he says God says Three kings will stand up in Persia. This is the Persian Empire. Right now, Daniel is in the middle of the rulership of the early Persian Empire. Three kings stand up in Persia. The fourth shall be richer than all of them. And by his strength through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Grecia, Greece. So that's, um, let's continue on. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his, his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside him. So we're going to go ahead and stop there. 
uh, well, I guess let's continue to verse 5. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes shall be strong above him and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. So verses 3, mighty king shall stand up. Verses 3 to 5, everything I just read there was about Darius the first, the actual guy who was named Darius, Darius the Mede. He is the fourth king. Three kings stand up in Persia. The fourth is greater than um, than all of them. Those three kings are the first kings of Persia. Cyrus, who is written about in scripture in um, Jeremiah. When Babylon was defeated, the Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus was the first king of the Pers of the Achaemenid Empire, which became the Persian Empire. Cyrus defeated Nebuchadnezzar and took captive the Israelites from Babylon, which is further east of Iran, and brought them to Iran, northern Iran, the seat of the Persian Empire. That's the first king during the time of Jeremiah. From that point forward, because they took the, um, the, the kingdom of Judah, the Levites essentially, the priests, and they brought them into the Persian Empire. We have Darius or um, Cyrus. The second king was Cambys II. The third king was Bardia. These are normal kings in the Persian Empire, the Achaemenid Empire. The fourth king is Darius I. We know from history was a lot greater than the rest. We know that Cyrus started the empire, the Achaemenid Empire, but Darius is known as one of the greatest kings of the uh, the empire. So the fourth is richer than all of them. Yeah. And he stirs up all against the kingdom of Greece. He absolutely does. So let me show you this here. This is um, a website called The Collector. Um, it's just it's a historical article on the kings of Persia. This is not this is not at all any kind of biblical source. This is a an atheistic or an agnostic source that literally only exists to tell you the history of the Persian Empire. Right here we see the start of the Achaemenid Empire, kings of Persia. This is the article. Starts with Cyrus, the Cyrus of Jeremiah. Um, and worth noting that if you look at the book of Ezra, because Ezra was one of the priests in the Persian Empire um, later on, Ezra chapters 4 through 6 literally calls out Cyrus to Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes being the um, the one before Xerxes II who only lives for 45 days, and then Ochus. So essentially he calls out the the last kings, the first king to the last king of the Achaemenid, Achaemenid Empire, Ezra 4 to 6. So we know specifically this is absolutely the kings in Persia. Because it calls them out in the correct order which kings existed. So it's it's not a question of like oh. my mic randomly turned off. Um, it's not a question of maybe this was a different Darius or a different Cyrus. It can't be. Because we have the names of the kings in order in the Persian Empire in a biblical context, which is not history, right? So if that's the case, then it's pretty uncanny that they managed to nail each king in the empire in chronological order. Much less that Daniel, in the time of Darius, had prophecies of the next four kings, four or five kings in the line, and their conquests. 300 years before they ever happen but this was written we know that it existed long before any of these guys were ever written about so the prophecy is confirmed through daniel because of history and what happened which had nothing to do with bible right so we start with cyrus the first king cyrus gives way to cambius and cambius gives way to bardia Bardia is murdered, gives way to Darius the first. This is the Darius that we're talking about here. Darius the Mede, Darius the Great. He
right here. Darius I incorporates Macedonia and a number of the Aegean Islands with the Greek cities into his empire. Darius starts the war against Greece. And this goes on throughout the next four or five hundred years. Um, I don't know how many, hundreds of years. It goes on until the end of the Peloponnesian War. But it starts really here with Darius. So, he stirs up the entire kingdom against Greece. The entire realm. Um, that's what happens. Now, we get to verses 5 again. Because this is, this is the end. This is, this is his... Um, his legacy um, is that he he was rich beyond the other kings, the the early kings of the Achaemenid Empire. Um, he rules with great dominion. When he stands up, his kingdom shall be broken. Now you might think that like you know the the empire is destroyed, but that's not it. He literally, as you can see right here, he divides the kingdom into twenty satrapies. The satraps are essentially governors. Darius, the great divides the kingdom himself into governances, 20 of them. But, as you can see, not to his posterity. This didn't work out in his favor or the, the um, Persian Empire's favor. In fact, through this, a lot of these governors use... Um, they, they essentially, they do, they do exploits. They use um, political powers and flatteries and betrayals and it, there's just a lot of infighting in the persian empire through these governance positions so while it might have made sense to darius to have these governments to control each part the people themselves that were in these positions of power were all corrupt and through corruption they continued the empire until it eventually is destroyed so we have right here in scripture lining up with history that Darius was the richest of them all, the fourth king in the line of the Achaemenids, uh, who divided the kingdom and it didn't work for him. And then verse five, his prince, one of his princes, his sons shall be strong above him, even greater than him. Who comes after Darius? Xerxes. The Xerxes, the 300 Xerxes, the man who believed himself to be God and who just destroyed everything he came into contact with. That Xerxes. So verses 5 and 6 are about that Xerxes, specifically the Xerxes of Esther. That Xerxes. Again, these the people of Israel that we see in the scriptures, Ezra, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, um, Esther, and others. They lived in the Persian Empire. They probably didn't know each other. In fact, they are generations apart, but they all were influenced by God to have these particular stories that eventually led to Israel going back to Israel and, and being made a, a, a nation again until, of course, they, uh, they are destroyed and sent to the, scattered to the winds again. Um, but that's not relevant now that's that's just history and how we got to where we are now this is about the antichrist xerxes esther's xerxes is that xerxes he wasn't a good guy like the cucumber um and specifically what it says about him he's strong above his father and has dominion and his dominion shall be a great dominion yes we know that that happened and in the end of years not the last days or the last years in the end of his years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an arrangement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in, this, in these times. That is such a complicated statement. Something very weird happens with this king and the daughter of the south and joining themselves together obviously like sex right and what is going on here that is absolutely legit because there is a huge scandal with xerxes and his wife not esther another wife his wife who is named let me find her here amistress i brought this up another secular site 
um, which has information about what happened with Xerxes. According to the tale, I'm going to read this here, Xerxes fell hopelessly in love, or at least in lust, with an unnamed woman in the city of Sardis. The king, mind you, was uh, at this point already a wedded man, to, married to a woman named Amistris. This is Xerxes' wife. Nevertheless, he sent this new woman in Sardis a numer uh, numerous messages, whatever, whatever. She, okay, so Xerxes hatches this plot right here. His brother, Masistes, Xerxes' brother, um, married a lady, and Xerxes fell in love with his brother's wife. So, he figured in order to have his brother's wife, he needed more time with her. In order to have more time with her, he has Mat Matisse's daughter, this lady he was, he's in love with, her daughter. He has her daughter marry his son, thereby bringing their families closer together. But... Xerxes then starts an affair with his son's wife, the one that he just coordinated into the, the family. Starts having an affair with his son's wife. Xerxes' wife finds out about it. And rather than taking revenge on Xerxes' brother, Masistus, or his wife, or his, his daughter, his son's wife, she takes it out on Masistus' wife. The one that Xerxes was actually in love with and initially wanted to have the affair with. And she cuts off all the body parts and probably killed her. Um, and as a result, Xerxes' brother flees and tries to gather rally support to rebel against the, the kingdom at that point. But of course, Xerxes has him killed. This, this is such a huge, random, just incest scandal. That's what's going on here, and these are essentially in the last days of the last years of Xerxes' power. Xerxes eventually loses um, a couple of fights in Greece, and he is murdered by one of his bodyguards. Um, that's what happened. He had a great dominion. He did his thing, and then, in the end of his years, he had this this scandal, and all of them are destroyed in it. Now, verses 7 through 19, this is significant because all of that, the most significant portion of this, is about Artaxerxes, Xerxes' son. Now, one of the things here, I'm just going to read it out and I'll point them out as we go. Out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in the estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them and shall prevail. Starting with that, obviously out of the branches of her roots, her son, Artaxerxes. So let's just move down here. The next king in the line, Artaxerxes. His name was Arsis. He was the third son of Xerxes and became king of Persia following the death of his father at the hands of Artabanus, which was his father Xerxes' royal bodyguard. So he becomes king. He, specifically, again, this is the secular source, he was faced with the major revolt in Egypt and more specifically Artaxerxes right here. As king of Persia, Artaxerxes I inherited a war with the Greeks. The war that eventually ends with the, it's a, the Peloponnesian War um, and eventually ends later on with uh, Ochus. This war lasted a long time, but because of Darius, this war began, and Artaxerxes, actually no, because of Xerxes, this war began, and Artaxerxes inherited the war. It wasn't over yet. So, he comes with an army. He didn't have to build the army. He already had the army. He inherits the army, and then he goes and has to conquer the Greeks. So... And also shall cap carry away, carry captives into Egypt, their gods, with their princes and their precious vessels of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the of the north, um, the king of the north being his his father, um, Xerxes, who ruled for 20 years. Artaxerxes ruled for 41 years. He continued more years than his father, 
and also he inherited the war so he comes with an army and this whole carries away captive thing right so let me show you that here's artaxerxes reign and another secular site split out so one of the most significant events that took place during his reign was the egyptian revolt it was led by a guy named inaris ii son of a libyan prince who supposedly could trace his roots back to the 12th uh, 26th dynasty of egypt it's like the glory days of egypt the uh the pharaohs essentially so right here the persians completed they were um the persians were compelled to fall back to memphis in 454 bc under the satrap of syria the Persians were able to destroy the Athenian fleet after a too long siege. The Athenians were guarding, essentially, uh, they were uh, allied with the Egyptians. And when finally they destroyed the Athenian fleet, Inaros, the Egyptian, was taken captive and then executed. So Artaxerxes finally destroyed the Egyptian revolt, carried away their gold, blah, blah, blah and survived longer than his father or um, continued more years than his father so the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return to his own land but his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a great multitude of forces and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through then he shall return and stir up even to his fortress this this verse right here right here 10 is about inaris one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through them this is the whole athenian fleet showing up uh, during the revolt he inherited the war he had the uh the army he eventually defeats the egyptians but this guy assembles inaros assembles a great force specifically the athenians and forces the king back so then he shall return and even be stirred up even to his fortress and the king of the south shall be moved with anger and shall come forth and fight with him even with the king of the north shall set forth a great multitude but the multitude shall be given into his hand yep so that's their battle and when he's taken away the multitude his heart shall be lifted up and cast down many thousands but he shall not be strengthened by it for the king of the north shall return this is him coming back with a greater multitude than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches and in so let's just stop right there so this back and forth with the egyptian empire and the athenians interfering um and it says right here they were compelled to fall back they fought they lost they were sent back but the king of the north being the uh the king of the north northern iran um the persian empire that's the king of the north um artaxerxes he goes back he rebuilds his army he comes back after certain years which is specific because the war here started in four approximately the revolt of egypt started in 460 bc and they fell back in 454 or they fell back and then in 454 that's almost that's 14 years after 14 years they come back and finally defeat egypt 14 years they had a war so after certain years he comes back with great army and in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish division but they shall fall so shall the king of the north come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people neither shall there be any strength to withstand but he that cometh shall come against him but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will and none shall stand before him and he shall stand in the glorious land this is not israel the glorious land is egypt which by his hand shall be consumed he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his own his whole kingdom and upright ones with him and thus shall he do he shall give them the daughter of women corrupting her and she shall not stand on his side neither before him after this he shall turn his face to the isles and shall take many but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease without his own reproach he shall cause it to turn upon him 
Then he shall turn his face towards the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. That is a mouthful, but let's talk about it. So, verses 17 to 18. He shall set his face to enter with the whole kingdom, the strength of the whole kingdom, upright ones with him. And he shall give him the daughter of men, uh, daughter of women, corrupting her. She shall not stand on the side before him. Then he turns his face to the isles. Many fall, but then this reproach happens and causes him to turn back. That is the Greek conquest. Um, obviously, just before that, the robbers of thy people. Again, this is God talking to Daniel in prophetic form. The robbers of the Israelites are the Egyptians. The robbers of your people. Um, they try to establish their vision. Obviously, it says here, Inaris is trying to reestablish his dynastic strength, trying to reestablish Egypt as a, you know, the pharaoh ship and their former glory of being the rulers of the world. Um, and they failed. That's all this right here. They, they exalt themselves to establish a vision, but they shall fall. He comes, the king of the north, Artaxerxes I. He destroys all of it. He takes everything he can, does whatever he wants, stands in the glorious land, Egypt, by his hand shall be consumed. And then he goes and turns his face to the isles. We see that right here. After the defeat of the uh, of the the Athenians and the Egyptians, we have the uh, we, where is it? There's a very specific thing right here, the peace, the peace of Caius. Now, this is a Wikipedia article. Granted, sure, but you can you can look it up anywhere. Um, the peace of Caius is something from Artaxerxes' time. After the defeat of the Egyptians and the Athenian fleet, there's this period of time, which is mentioned by Herodotus, I believe it was, um, called the peace of Caius. No one knows much about this peace and how it was brokered what it really entailed but during the point during the period of Artaxerxes the first as he was conquering the Greek Isles suddenly he stopped and made peace with the the uh, the Greeks why no one knows he had no reason to stop his conquest no one could stop him but he decided to stop and to accept this peace according to scripture here it's a, a reproach on his own behalf offered him, uh, offered by him to cease. This is the piece of Caius. Now I hate, I, I, I kind of hate that they they use all this he and him and whatnot because it's not very specific. It's very vague, and this him could be this him. These are two. They, it could be like different people, and you just don't know. And that's how riddles work. God did that on purpose because he had it hidden until the right time when he would reveal that information which he currently has verse 20 says then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom but within a few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle this is artaxerxes kingdom his estate the one who is established after that point the raiser of taxes he raises taxes on egypt to to gather more money and he, of course, taxes the um, the Athenians as well. This is kind of how they're raising money for the empires. They're taxing, overtaxing their enemies. Um, this guy raises taxes in the glory of the kingdom, specifically Egypt. And in a few days, it says he shall be destroyed. Obviously, it's not three days, um, but few days. It, it didn't take long. And specifically, we see from the uh, the the documentation, the secular accounts. Xerxes II was murdered by assassins um, sent by his brother, Sogdianus, and Sogdianus is in turn murdered by his half-brother, Aukus. So three kings that happened there, but specifically the one that's counted as the king, both by history and by scripture here, is Xerxes II, and he only lasted 45 days. The fact that the Bible says... He lasts a few days. He's destroyed after a few days. And the fact that the next guy in line historically lasted days, that's also significant. We are seven kings in 
and every single king has been called out specifically by their actions and it's one to one with history secular history and biblical scripture biblical prophecy because again this was written in the time of Darius the first before Xerxes the one who conquered most of the Persian Empire ruthlessly who destroyed the Athenians and the Spartans that Xerxes was a little kid when Daniel was wandering the palace this was prophecy of that guy's son's son son right <laughs> like it's it's many generations into the future this is information that there is absolutely no way Daniel could have ever pulled out of his butt you know God gave him this information it's documented we have the dates. We know when this was written. It tells you who the leader was at that time. And then he proceeds to tell you what's going to happen in the future. And now, two and a half thousand years later, we can look back and see this happened in that Persian line. And again, they're calling out the Persian people, the Persian uh, kingship, the Achaemenid kings, as being the line from which the Antichrist comes. So this guy stands in the kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. He was drunk, and he was murdered by assassins sent by his brother. The assassins had no quarrel with him. They just were hired to assassinate him, and they did while he was drunk. There was no anger in that. So the next thing that happens, it says, uh, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom but he shall come in peaceably and to obtain the kingdom by flatteries and with the arms of a flood that sh they shall be overflown before him this is ochus the one who rises and instead is a vile person he obtains the kingdom through flatteries with his wife the eunuchs and his corrupt political officials they usurp essentially the kingdom he's still counted as a king um, but he definitely did not earn it. And what he does with the kingdom, very specifically, he, he is known for not really fighting, but using his political exploits, his, his corruptness, in order to fund his enemies whenever he wanted to defeat some other enemy. He specifically does this to defeat the Athenians by funding the Spartans. And by dumping all of the money that he got from the taxation of Egypt into Sparta, which is what his fathers did not do, specifically says he shall enter peaceably and upon even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have done, not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, and the riches. Yea, he shall forecast devices against the strongholds even for a time. Um, shall stir up. In his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army and the king of the south shall be stirred to battle with a very great army but shall not stand for they shall forecast devices against him yea they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him and his army shall overflow and shall fall down and both these kings hearts shall be to do mischief they shall speak lies at one table and it shall not prosper for the end shall be at the appointed time then shall he return to his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. We are talking about the Peloponnesian War. In order to destroy his enemies, Ochus, Caius, funds the Spartans ruthlessly to the point where they can rebuild their fleet and defeat the Athenians ending effectively the Peloponnesian War and once they do that once he ends this war he is richer than ever and he goes back to the Persian Empire but in order to get back from Athens you have to go through the Mediterranean and you see what as soon as you hit land you're in Jerusalem you're in the land of Israel and what he sees is that the um, not I think they rebuilt the temple at that point i'm not sure but he sees jerusalem with its newly fortified walls and gates and people who were under the persian empire whom his fathers told everyone do not touch these people let them live we know that they ruled the entire world in the past but 
all of those those fathers of his his specific father his actual father biological father artaxerxes um his great grandfather darius and his great 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 grandfather cyrus all three of these kings known as great kings in their history um they writ decrees protecting the israelites and giving them all of the funding they could possibly want for anything they needed throughout the persian empire he couldn't touch them and so yeah when he went back after destroying all of his enemies and he looks back and sees well here's this people that we conquered uh in the beginning of our empire and why are they prospering like why why can't i do anything about this he knows the laws he knew he couldn't touch them and then that leads all the way up to ver um, t verse 28 he goes back to his land he's got great riches but he's against the holy covenant he wants to do something about it and he can't verse 29 separates the prophecy of what's about to happen in daniel's time to the end times at the appointed time he shall return and come towards the south but it shall not be as the former or as the latter meaning it he won't return um or when he return it's not going to be as the first time where he went to, to athens and egypt and fought and lost and it's not going to be as the latter where he went over there to athens and egypt and fought and won he's going to show up and try to go and probably visit athens because again he's been dead for 2500 years suddenly finds himself out of hell and back in his empire in 2023 or 2024 and goes to see what's going on and the ships of shittim which are specifically the the old name for the galilean ships uh shittim the, if you have heard of shittim wood that is something those are trees in the area of galilee so the ships of shittim are referenced to israel they conquered those lands israel's ships will come against him and won't let him pass and because of this he is grieved He's not upset, not angry. He is grieved in his heart because having come back from the dead, still being dead somehow, but still being alive somehow, he comes back into this time period and sees that the Persian Empire, the Achaemenid kings are gone. No one remembers anything about them. The Babylonian Empire, who they conquered, is gone. Nobody remembers anything about them. We don't even know their language. And the uh, the Assyrian, no, not the Assyrian, the um, the Egyptian Empire is gone. Nobody remembers anything about the Egyptian Empire. We don't even know their language. These great empires of the world that he in his time understood are gone. Even his own empire is nothing but myth and legend now. And the only ancient people still in existence today is israel that nation that they conquered and that his fathers said they could not be touched this is what he comes back and sees that the nation of israel today has ships that are completely outside of anything the persian empire could have ever conceived like if you've seen and just google a warship in israel these these the vehicles that we have created with technology today one of our ships would have destroyed the world back then could easily have destroyed every single nation on earth and wiped out humanity that's the kind of technology we deal with today and he's going to come back and go exploring and find out very quickly that eat that that israel a nation that used to be under their control that they let prosper has become the only surviving ancient culture in the world today as it's charging my my headphone tries to die and that is going to grieve him to the point that he's going to go back into the treasuries of the persian empire because again he was the ruler of the treasury uh, or the ruler of the persian empire in the early days uh, last of the kings uh, kings he knows where the treasury is he knows where all the extra gold and on everything that they took from egypt and from persia and from uh, babylon 
all of that treasure he knows exactly where it is more specifically he knows exactly where the scrolls are within the treasury that talk about the ancient uh, the, the the ancient civilizations around and he knows the languages he knows ancient Sumerian his name was written in cuneiform he knows how to read that stuff he knows how to read it, uh, Egyptian he knows Greek like he has all of this information the Bible uh, calls out later in um, somewhere mentions that the Antichrist will um, have he, knowledge of dark sayings is what it is what it says um, and that's true because things that we don't know anymore and haven't haven't known for the last 2500 years or at least 2000 years since the roman empire fell like these things like even alexander the great he didn't know about them he wasn't alive around then alexander the great the grecian empire that rises after the persian empire the roman empire which takes over after them then you have like you know the middle ages and all the kingships and the catholic church and everything like m multiple empires have risen and fallen since his time and we don't remember any of them and israel is still around yeah he's going to be super grieved and he's going to go and find all that information and come back with indignation against the holy covenant and he will return with intelligence that forsakes the holy covenant that doesn't mean that like he's going to like be like oh there's no god or whatever he's going to come back and be like listen you guys are israel and you have denied your god he's going to come back with evidence that proves that they are not the people that they say they are not that they aren't like the israelites sure they are but they aren't the pious people that they purport to be and of course the bible goes through all that the israel israel according to revelation chapter 17 you have the whole thing with the the horror of babylon it's um she is um the horror of babylon sits on the dragon with seven heads um and the seven heads are seven nations seven mountains on, w on whom she sits and if we look at deuteronomy i'm just going to bring this up here deuteronomy chapter seven deuteronomy chapter seven verse 1 literally the first verse in Deuteronomy what we get is the Lord God shall bring you into your land where whither you go and possess it and shall cast out many nations before thee he mentions the the people the Hittites the Girgashites the Amorites the Canaanites the Perizzites the Hivites the Jebusites seven nations greater and mightier than thou the seven hills if you've ever been to Jerusalem or just look it up it's all giant hills they they're not mountains they're they're like they kind of are like mountains but they're really just big hills and that's why if you look at the book of Judges or the book of um Joshua when they first enter into the kingdom and you see them attacking Ai and Jericho other kings around them see that and they gather themselves and come to fight how is that possible because literally jerusalem and the land around jerusalem is seven hills and from the top of any one of those hills you can see what's going on further off they literally it's a it's a nation of hills and those hills are where the kings established their their kingdoms their their fortresses that's why she sits on those seven nations those seven waters which represent the seven tongues that are not her own you need more evidence take a look at john take a look at matthew jesus himself calls out the pharisees and says your fathers let me let me let me just bring it up for you woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say if we had been in the days of our fathers we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets wherefore you are witness unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets jesus said that jesus said that and right after he says fill you up then the measure of your fathers you serpents you generation of vipers how can you escape the damnation of hell now the whore of babylon is said to be drunk on the blood of the saints let me continue 
Wherefore, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that you may come all the right then up that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets, and that stones them which are sent unto you, how often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. That is the word of Jesus to the prophet, to the um, Pharisees. That is, in no uncertain terms, blaming, literally he blames the nation of Israel for the blood of the prophets. No one else. He said, not just the blood of the prophets, all innocent blood from Abel, Cain and Abel. Abel to Zacharias and of course that includes when they killed him and his apostles this is all on the heads of Jerusalem because they are the people of God and they refused God if you go to Samuel Samuel um, is the one who puts Saul into power the people of Israel the elders showed up to Samuel and like hey we want a king, a judge over us like the kings of the rest of the world. And he said, no, that's a that's a terrible idea. Um, and he, they said, whatever, tell God. So he goes and tells God. He's like, listen, the people are asking this. And God says, go ahead, give them a king. Because they have not rejected you. They have rejected me. Let me get you that verse too. They have not rejected That is 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. The Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto you. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to the works which they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, until this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also to you. So, the Israelites, by the mouth of the Father and by the mouth of the Son, have rejected God and have murdered every prophet and righteous person that he sent unto them. For that, he promises throughout Scripture that he will judge them and their judgment will be violent. It is through the Antichrist. He will utterly forsake the Israelites to the point, as the Bible says in Revelations, where if he did not intervene, no flesh would be saved. It is unto the point where the temple is destroyed so vehemently that a flood bursts out of the land and pours into the valleys of Kidron all the way down to the Dead Sea. To that point where Jesus returns, where they look upon the one they've pierced, their judgment will continue. That the whole reason for the wickedness in the world and the reason that the world has gotten this bad is because we don't really have God here with us anymore. Yeah, as Christians, we have God within us. The kingdom of God is within you, as Jesus said. But talking to the people who believe in him, to the rest of the world, there is no God. Jesus, the Father left. Jesus left. The only version of God that exists here on earth now is within us Christian believers. Everything else is hell because the Israelites that are supposed to be the beacon for God in this world long ago rejected him and let the world get to this point. They wholeheartedly embraced everything that God said was wicked and made it a part of their culture. That is why we are where we are, and that is why the Antichrist has to come, to purge the world of all sin. When he comes, Jesus will separate the wheat from the tares. He will gather all of his people, and the only people left on earth will be the wicked and the 144,000 
of the tribe of, of Israel who are left and marked to continue preaching the gospel. 144,000 people out of 8 billion. Of course, the earth gets dwindled very, very quickly to almost no one as essentially the population will go from 8 billion to zero um, by the end. And of course, that is the day of judgment. So that's that's what we're, we're talking about there. That's the Antichrist. That's whole um, verse 29, 29 to 28, specifically his um, his exploits. He comes back and his heart will be against still the, the Holy Covenant, Israel, and he will do exploits and he will broker a deal with Israel, a peace treaty with Israel. He'll, he'll have them rebuild the temple. Then he will sit in the temple, call himself God, will destroy Israel. This is his plan. And, and it will succeed. And we'll see it succeed. But more importantly, we will know him the moment he arrives. Because we know who he is. We know his identity, his name. We kind of have a face just by um, the documents and the stila and the imprints. We at least know he's got beard. We know his age, 71 years old. We know he's um, going to end up being the supreme ruler in Iran because there's only one supreme ruler right now who's 86 years old. He's looking for his um, his um, successor, and there's a lot of speculation on whether who that's going to be. No one really knows, but the Antichrist is going to have to be a supreme ruler in Iran, where he comes from, in order to have an army to be able to go to Israel in the first place. And again, Iran being a Muslim state. Um, he will take that and be able to rally not only the Muslims, but also the Israelites into peace, which is the current problem in the Middle East. And through that, we have the whole situation with the Antichrist, which everyone knows whether or not you've read the Bible. That is the significance of this story. So another thing I'm going to talk about here is the, the name itself, Cass. Right? So we, we know from Scripture, again, from John, who wrote the book of revelation and his own gospel 250 plus years after he should have died um the the characters themselves there's kind of an x and there's a a c with a little squiggly at the end like a sa um and if you look at the name ocus in its original greek it's got um it's got no, not sigma was the other phi in the front and it has the x it doesn't have that middle symbol, and it has the sa. The only difference between ocus and the um, this this other term in in, um, in Greek is the middle character, but it's literally translated through sounds phonetically as k for the first character, ks for the second, and s for the last, meaning that it, there's a hard k and an hard s, kas. So. Whether or not you want to believe that this is a stretch, the fact remains that this could have been any king, any king at all in the Persian Empire that this lined up with historically, right? We could have gone through and said, okay, well, this kind of fits with this guy and this kind of fits with that guy. We get to the eighth king who is the Antichrist. What's his name? Uh, well, his name is um, Xerxes II. Okay, well, that's that's nowhere near this. How is his name, name going to add up anywhere near to 666? It has to be a short name. But for it to be Aukus, and for that O, which is uh, honorific, because sometimes the names in, in Sumerian have the O, and sometimes they don't, very similar to Japanese culture, like you could say Okasan, which is like mother, with an honorific of the O, or you could say Kasan, which is a little more formal, or um, informal, right? It's the same thing. So if you drop that O, you have Kas. And if you have Kas, that sounds a lot like this. It sounds, in fact, exactly like it. And if you look at the characters themselves, it's the same characters except for the center, right? So it doesn't matter whether or not you think it's, it's a stretch because it is just too close to be possible coincidence. It is just impossible. It, the eight billion names 
that have been used in all of humanity and all of history and the Bible centered on the Persian Empire, specifically the eight Achaemenid kings, of which there were only eight, not because they chose to only have eight, because the Persian Empire lasted a lot longer than that, but specifically because there were only eight. And the eighth person happened to have a name that matches with what John wrote in Revelation as the name of the Antichrist. Who happened to have a Greek name as well because he was in combat with the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Persians. There's, it's, it's, there's too much. It's not coincidence. It can't be coincidence. Not to mention again that the book of Daniel was written in the time of one of those kings four generations before this guy existed. Daniel never heard of this guy. He just wrote what he was given by God. That's it. So this this is the guy. It's it's Ochus who took the name Darius the Second. And he's from Iran, from the Persian Empire, the northern part of, of Iran, and he will come again from Iran, meaning as a political move, he has to take supreme rulership over Iran in order to take over the, the Iranian Empire. Um, and when he does that, he'll take that army and move into Israel. That's just that's the only way this works. And that's specifically how the Bible says it's going to work. He's not going to be a random guy who just shows up and like, hey, I'm your God, and they're just going to let him in. No, he's going to come in as a broker of peace of a nation, of a Muslim nation, because you can't show up and be like, I'm going to broker peace with you guys. What nation are you? What religion? What faith? Oh, I I'm, I believe in Buddha, and I'm going to broker peace in the Middle East against the Muslims and the, uh, and the Jews. That's not a thing. But if he comes in as ruler of supreme ruler of Iran – a peacemaker of the Muslim nations coming into Israel and saying, we are going to make peace now. And also, I'm your, your, your Messiah. They're going to believe it because Israel has been waiting for their Messiah. They murdered Jesus because they didn't want him to be their God. They didn't want him to be their Messiah because he was going to take away their power, their authority. This guy's not going to do that. He's going to give them all authority. They get to live on Earth, and we're going to make heaven on Earth. Everyone, especially the New Age people who are outside of religion and who know nothing about scripture and religion and faith, they're going to eat it up, but most significantly, most significantly the Israelites are too. So, yeah, it's going to work. But yes, we know now. We know the name. We know his identity. Not a random dude. This is like a legitimate Persian leader. Um, he's coming back from the dead. And he will be ruling the Iranian Empire, and he will come into the land of Egypt and become the Antichrist and murder all the Christians, as many as he could get his hands on. Um, but we have to have faith and just trust in God that we will we will do miracles, we'll get away where he lets us, and when it's time to go, it's time to go. Either way, we have eternal life, right? So, so that's significant. That's what we need to remember. As to the supreme ruler, um, yeah, we know the, the – I said it already. The guy is 86 years old, and he's he, – there's a lot of speculation on who's going to be the next supreme ruler of Iran, and nobody really knows who. And there's already conspiracies within Iran, and I'm assuming they still kind of have the satrapacies, um, and people who are ready to vote whoever this guy wants to be the supreme ruler right out of office. So it's got to be someone – who they can't do that with. And my money, my money is on August. Whether or not he comes up immediately next, he will show up in Iran. And he will be the supreme ruler of Iran. And he will move into Israel. So we are waiting to see Ocus Cass on the scene in Iran. That is the Antichrist. That's the, the identity of the Antichrist. Take the information I've given you. Look through it. Daniel 11, Revelation 17. You can check out the words of Jesus again. It's it's not hard. It's quick. Just three days with an audiobook, you'll be done with the entire New Testament. It's all you really need, right? Just just look into it. Don't take this and be like, oh well, just another person saying something that I've actually never heard before. Like, listen to it because if it comes to the point 
where the Antichrist comes on the scene, the Bible says that everyone who is not written in the book of life will worship this man. Then you have a very short time between now and when he actually shows up. We see it in the news. That is a very small window between your salvation, your eternal salvation, and your eternal damnation. If you have any doubts, any doubts whatsoever on whether or not this is real, just look into it. Just look into it. I just showed you what the Bible said at a time where it couldn't have possibly known and how that specifically lined up to eight kings from an empire that the Bible specifically said it was referencing. No one has seen this before for a reason. Second Thessalonians mentioned God would not allow this information to be revealed until the end, until the last days. That means he revealed it to me because it is the last days. I'm probably not the only person to have been revealed this to. I'm just one person who will have access somehow because I have no followers. I have this word will get out that much I trust. Why? Because I know. So if God gave me this information, it's not because he expects me to try and then like, oh, I picked the wrong guy because he doesn't have a million followers. It's because God knows how to transfer this information and he will do so. That's why I'm reaching out. That's why I've taken all the time to put this together. That's why I'm re-recording this because my microphone, for whatever reason, keeps shutting off and dying on me. And I literally had to take like an hour worth of information and re-speak it because like this weird stuff is happening. Like my, my headphones, which are currently working right now, died while they were charging. That has never happened. They shut off while I was talking multiple times during the video. That has never happened. It's, 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 it's spiritual. Obviously, this information is real. I've made multiple videos. Never once have I ever had this amount of trouble putting together information to reveal. But I know how significant this information is. It is literally, it is a matter of life and death. Eternal life and eternal death. And we have willing to bet less than 10 years to figure this out, to, to figure out your faith, to come to Jesus and realize God loves you and he loves you so much that he died for your sins. How is that significant? He didn't cause any of your suffering. Other suffering people caused your suffering. He allowed you to cause suffering to other people and he still gives you the option to repent of that so that you can be made whole and live eternally in peace. You still have that option. He knew that you would reject him. He knew that you would be selfish. He knew that you would hurt people. Even if you haven't hurt a lot of people, you are still against God if you did not accept Jesus and his sacrifice. If you think that you're a good person, you need to prove it and you cannot prove it because according to the Ten Commandments, the only way by which you can be justified, you have already failed because you have to be perfect for your entire life. Children lie immediately. They act out in anger immediately. They are counted as sinful. All of us. Children aren't going to hell. They're given forgiveness from God. That is sure. But for us who have the mental wherewithal to make that decision to choose Christ and reject him, you will have to justify yourself and you cannot. It is not possible. Hell is your only option. And hell is not a burning fiery place. It's just a place outside of the presence of God. And hell will be thrown into the lake of fire, that fiery place you heard about, which no one has experienced yet. That's what's coming. That's way worse than the Antichrist showing up and taking over the world for a little bit and, and you know, killing some Christians, which most of the world is going to accept as a good thing. That's stupid. It's crazy. And if you're listening to me right now, you're an atheist, an agnostic, whatever, that's insane to kill people 
for their faith. And that's what the world will do under this guy, Cass. Don't let it. Don't let it get that far. Just pray. How do you pray? Talk as if you were talking as if I as I'm talking to you now. That is how you pray. Ask God to reveal it to you. you need to accept the sacrifice of Jesus. You have not interacted with him. Most of us have not interacted with him, but we know by faith he is real. This is proof that the scripture is real, that the Bible is real. And if that's real, then Jesus is real because I'm a Christian. If I was not a Christian, then I might doubt some of this stuff. But the fact that I am Christian and there is a real God who gave me real information that pointed to future events that no one has seen before, all of that connects to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being real. And if all that's real, Jesus is real. And if he's real, he died for his sins. And if he died for his sins, the only way to eternal life is through him. That is the fact. You need, you need to pray. Ask God to reveal it to you. That's all you have to do. Don't sit on this. This is super important. We need to watch. We need to be ready because our time, this earth's time is short. I'm not going to say Jesus is coming because that sounds too fluffy. The reality is the Antichrist is coming and with him comes death and judgment. Watch and be ready.